The Institute for Real Growth was founded to help CMOs and other growth leaders drive more humanized growth. The IRG is not-for-profit and fully independent. We are proud to be backed by important marketing industry leaders, as well as prestigious executive search, leadership, and academic institutions. All IRG programs connect CMOs and other growth leaders to peers, experts, and thought leadership. The invitation-only IRG 100 Leadership Program provides senior growth leaders benchmarking tools and learning from thought leaders and peer practitioners, helping develop a practical, humanized growth plan for their business and themselves. The program runs for 26 weeks with 90-minute sessions each week. The corporate IRG 1000 program helps teams of 20 cross-functional colleagues from the same organization build new value propositions and growth capabilities. IRG 1000 combines collective Zoom and small group breakout discussions with individual self-learning to provide a true blended learning growth experience. The IRG Masterclasses offer three-hour deep dives into 12 core IRG humanized growth topics, ranging from developing a more abundant market definition to developing new evolving experiences, and from building more open culture to leading human-centric transformations. The IRG Humanized Growth Series go in-depth for an hour with some of the world's most acclaimed growth leaders and experts. Interviewees so far have included the CEOs of Unilever and Mars, the CMOs of Google, Natura, Coca-Cola and Patagonia, and topic experts like Professor Colin Mayer of Oxford University, Greg Welch of Spencer Stewart, and self-care guru Deepak Chopra. All IRG program participants and alumni can always leverage the value of the IRG community and resources as they continue to drive more humanized business and personal leadership growth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And we know that you are indeed all over the world. This is Mark de Swanayons, one of the founders of the Institute for Real Growth. And you're joining us today for the latest in episode of the Humanizing Growth series. And although I will introduce her properly in a few minutes, I want to give a very, very warm welcome to Sanda Ojiambo, the CEO of the United Nations Global Compact, and uh, before we get into the materials, if you don't mind, just tell us where you are and how you are. Thank you, Mark. First, thank you for inviting me. It's really great to be here. I'm a great fan of the work that you all do. Look, I'm sitting in my apartment in New York. Um, it's cold. I think yesterday was the coldest day on record in New York for a couple of years going back. So bang in the middle of sort of a delayed winter. Um, it means a lot because I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, I moved here about a year and a half ago to, to take up the role, bang in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I'm doing well, though. I, I think, uh, you know, anybody who's had to change roles in, in this pandemic period or, or relocate or go through some of these life changing shifts that we all have has a lot of reflections. And I think, <laughs> you know, every day when you wake up and, and count your small wins and, and and look at how much you've adjusted and what you're able to do in new environments. Uh, COVID notwithstanding is, is always a big win. So look, I'm well. Uh, I would love to have been more in the office with my colleagues and, mm. and doing a lot more face-to-face -face and perhaps even doing this session with you live. Uh, yes. But be that as it may, um, as I say, I'm, I'm in New York and, and keeping well. Well, uh, it's very special that you could make the time. And um, what not everybody knows that uh, uh, we've been working quite closely, I'm not allowed to say partnering, but very closely with the United Nations Global Compact. And uh, it's an organization that, um, that you need to know about because the United Nations Global Compact is really, and I'm going to just uh, bastardize the proper role probably, but it's the business side of the United Nations. As we all know, the Sustainable Development Goals were defined and uh, our partner in the program, uh, Paul Pullman, was highly involved in that. And there was a real insight that businesses would be a major contributor in helping achieve those sustainable development goals. 
and um, the uh, United Nations Global Compact plays a significant role in that, but I'll ask you to explain that in a minute. Sanda comes from a rich background of uh, UN roles uh, in different agencies uh, across the board, but then also had a very significant stint at uh, one of the companies who uh, brought one of our first participants in the program, Sylvia, from uh, Safaricom. So has she seen both the business side of it as well as the agency side of it? And I think that probably is why she was picked for now the top role um, at the United Nations uh, Global Compact. Sanda, welcome. Thank you so much for making the time. And perhaps you indeed can tell a little bit about your role there and the role of uh, the UN Global Compact. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, again for those kind words. Look, um, so the UN Global Compact really, as you say, you know, works to mobilize the private sector around the goals of the United Nations. At present, those are the sustainable development goals. Um, it was founded in the year 2000 uh, by the then Secretary General Kofi Annan. And, and when he founded the compact, he said he wanted to bring a human face to the global market. So how cool is that? You know, you talk about humanizing growth. Our yeah. founders, uh, yeah. Secretary General at that time talked about, you know, a human face to the global market. And it was really a recognition that business really had a broader role to play. That business, you know, wouldn't only engage in the business of business, but business needed to get involved in societal transformation. So Kofi Annan spoke in the year 2000 when 2021, 2022 now actually, you know, a couple of years away from the sustainable development goals that have again continued to frame this role of business around the table. When the SDGs, as we call them in short, were formulated in 2015, private sector had a key role. This time it was very clear that government, the United Nations, private sector and civil society were being called to mobilize on delivering on these really important goals for humanity. So, so what does the UN Global Compact do? I mean, I think first it's, it's really important to, to say that it's, it's not a CSR based organization. What the Global Compact has at heart is how do we work with businesses to help transform the way that they do business to give added value. So we're very clear that purpose, principles and profit can coexist all in one. You can do great business and you can do good and you can do good and do great business. Now, the question is what, what puts us all together and what problems are we solving? And, and what's our engagement above and beyond simply churning out products and services into adding value to society as a whole? I mean, I always say, you know, business cannot succeed on the long term if society around it is failing. And so I really think it's incumbent on business to, to really take a look at what that looks like. So the Global Compact provides a toolkit of principles, of, 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 of trainings, of programs, of engagement opportunities, of learning opportunities. For right now, we have 15,000 companies around the world to both become stronger businesses, but also contribute to these global challenges. Oh, fantastic. And uh, what a call to action and what a clear explanation for why we're having this conversation. Um, I said that we were collaborating. Um, it's important to mention that uh, two of the participants in the IRG 100 program have come from your team. Um, Sue Allchurch uh, was the CMO of your organization, was a participant last year and is now an alumni. And Dan Thomas, your uh, current, I believe, head of communications globally, is a, a very valued participant in the program. Um, I, if, if it's okay, I really want to drill down to how companies and leaders in those companies and even perhaps specifically marketers in those companies can benefit from your organization and can contribute to what it is that you're striving. But before we go there, I wanted to take a little bit of a step back. You already mentioned it's 2022. It's hard to believe. And we look back two years and I don't think anyone would claim that they've had more change in a short period of time than these last two years. Let, let's make it really personal. It's a good way for us to get to know you a little bit as well. Can you just talk a little bit about your personal COVID experience? Yeah, wow, that was amazing. So, you know, this this started off for me in, in Nairobi, Kenya. So when, when the pandemic hit, I was still working in my former role at Safaricom, where I headed up what we call sustainable business and, and social impact. And, um, you know, I, I first remember, Mark, actually watching TV, you know, and everything was yeah. normal on, on, you know, normal, whatever normal is now on our end of the world. But, you know, on the feed through BBC and CNN, there was this, this, uh, this uh, you know, 
this pandemic that, that, that was emerging. I don't know that we called it a pandemic in the first instance. Yeah, yeah. And it was far had, away. Yes, it was, you know, something was happening, you know, and we saw it first actually through the impact in the US and we watch a lot of CNN back home and, and the BBC. And I just remember seeing these really vivid images of actually New York City that was in the epicenter and the, the, the disruption and, and the tragedy um, around it. Mm -hmm. But it was very clear from where we sat that that was happening in only one part of the world, you know? And I recall this was probably, you know, January, February. Um, and I remember watching the news and watching it unfold, you know, we're in a company that, you know, is part of a global, uh, you know, it's part of Vodafone, that's a global business. So I remember sort of some early warning and preparedness type communication and, and start watching and monitoring and seeing what's relevant for your country, but it still seemed very far off. But then I remember in March, it sort of started becoming closer to home. I can't remember exactly where now the first uh, incidence of COVID on the African continent was, but I certainly remember when the first COVID case hit Kenya, because it was a massive headline, you know, down to terminology such as patient zero, you know, tracking that this person had come in on a flight, looking at what happened, you know, seeing, you know, our response teams in hazmat, it, it brought everything to life. And, you know, right then and there, everything changed. So, you know, we did as many companies did and said, you know, work from home. Great that we're in a telecommunications company because that shift was pretty seamless. But again, like many people, we just sort of acted on our feet and, and went home and had to figure out how to keep teams mobilized and, and do what they needed to do. To some extent, by the way, I think I was really fortunate because in my position then, uh, because I also engaged in a lot of social impact work, I was quickly tapped on to help uh, support a response, not only for the company, but also for the private sector in Kenya. So I, I sort of had to keep actually three lenses because you want to worry about your family and your household. You, you want to worry about, you know, the company and, and your staff and your colleagues. And then I've always had the opportunity to, to put my skills and experience to work for, for countries, for ecosystems, et cetera. So I had three levels of engagement, you know, with the pandemic back home and, um, and that's what it meant. I, I remember just being tremendously busy, um, you know, uh, looking after, I don't have kids, but I, my sisters actually brought their kids over to stay with me. And so <laughs> I had some kids that I had to sort of look after and keep going, you know, from a homeschool perspective. Um, I had my team to continue working with and keep motivated amidst all this uncertainty. And then I had to support an initiative around the national COVID response for Kenya. Wow. That that's really what it looked like for me. But you know, Mark, I actually didn't leave my house for two months. Um, I've got to yeah. thank technology, you know, for yeah. keeping us connected. But also very quickly, you know, you you may or may not. I mean, Kenya's truly the hotbed of innovation around mobile money and e-commerce. Yes. It was amazing how so quickly everything I needed was available on a phone. You pay by mobile money. It's much quicker and efficient than you know credit card payments. It gets down to very you know low levels of the financial ecosystem. You can pay individual vendors directly. People will bring your product, you know, delivered by a motorcycle rider. And it was yeah, funny it's how incredible. literally in, in, you know, a matter of weeks, my ecosystem was reshaped, but I had everything that I needed to, to be able to, to, to go on. But I'm very conscious that only happened for a select few. In a country like mine, mm -hmm. I know that many uh, students were not able to continue with school because they're not digitally connected. Mm. I know that many SMEs shut down because the way that they did business didn't allow for a seamless transition. So I'm always acutely aware that those benefits only apply to a certain part of, of the population around the world, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually didn't mention this to you before, but um, I'm on the board of a school in Kibabo in Nairobi, uh, the Red Rose School. And uh, we had to shut down completely, as all other schools. But I believe that that's also the period that you you came over, right? You 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 came over to an empty. So when did you come over to New York and the UN? And when did when was the first time you actually met anyone at the UN? Yeah. You know that's you know that saying navigating ambiguity or you know working through ambiguity. I think I could write the story on that one because um, you know I I got the job in June and. Um, you know, sorry, actually the announcement was in May and I, I got the job, you know, it was a very fast turnaround um, in terms of, you know, having to leave my former role and, and join the UN. And I recall I took over virtually. So there was a sort of virtual handover ceremony because my predecessor was in Copenhagen at the time. The Global Compact had its, one of its huge annual convenings and I was in Kenya. So again, technology connected us. At that moment, actually the Kenyan borders were closed. So I couldn't leave if I wanted to. 
But in September, there came a slight window and um, I thought, okay, you know, if you're gonna make the move, this is now because who wants to come to New York later, possibly in winter and start apartment hunting and, and all of that, you know? So um, yeah, so I flew over. Um, a couple of first things that struck me, you know, I flew Emirates, it is typically a bustling airline full of people. I have never seen such an empty flight in my life. I've never seen such an empty Dubai airport you know, all of the duty-free shops shut, couldn't buy your perfume, couldn't buy your stuff, you know. It was, it was one of the oddest flights I've ever taken, you know, in my life, and, and I got here. Um, the team was excellent, you know, they'd set up some temporary accommodation for myself. I didn't see any of them, um, and I came right in just before our General Assembly week and just sat down and, and went into sort of working online. Um, you asked some really relevant pieces, you know, and as, as I reflect, I always reflect you know, every three months, you know, what has changed and what has changed incrementally. It actually took me a year and a month until I met my entire leadership team in person. Wow. Um, it took me about two to three months until I met, you know, more than two or three individuals at a time. Yeah. It took me about um, a month and a bit to, to meet my boss. I mean, that's also primarily more due to scheduling, but really just letting you know that, I mean, I, I got here and I just, I literally just got to work. Um, I still to date have not met all of my team, although increasingly more and more people were coming to the office just before you know, the Omicron piece has changed dynamics slightly. I'm really grateful we're able to have a, a great Christmas get together in person before Omicron. Uh, not everybody, but at least 80% attendance of our staff in New York. Mm, so mm. It's, it's incremental, but I'm approaching sort of a year and a half in role and to date really haven't met all of the team as is. Wow. Um, I'm starting to travel a little bit more and that helps because we're a global organization with a global footprint. So the opportunity to, to meet some of our local chapters and networks and be on the ground and understand what we look like there, there is great. But um, it was, it's been surreal. Surreal is probably I how I describe imagine. it. We, we had one participant in our program who actually got a new job and left the new job without having met anybody. <laughs> that wow. the two might be related, but that's almost a crazy story. Yeah. Um, so on that, if you don't mind, I mean, now I, I see you in New York. Um, I understand your professional background, what I haven't asked you, and I think it's, it's, it's um, valid to sort of just use that as a basis. Can you talk a little bit about your, your, your personal purpose? Uh, we ask this question of everyone, when, mm -hmm. when, do you have one? And if you did do, when did it become clear to you? And how has it helped you take important decisions like, do I want to leave Kenya and, and, go, to Nairo, uh, and go to New York? So, so first, you know, on purpose, um, I, over time, have begun to appreciate that purpose isn't a final destination. I, I don't always believe that people have one clear purpose and it remains that in time. I think if anything, this period with the COVID pandemic has shown us that what one may perceive as purpose can change radically given the circumstances within which you operate. I was just reading a couple of weeks ago about you know, the phrase, the great resignation, yeah. and the fact that the reason why there's been so much mobility is because people mm. actually realize that maybe in how we were before, this is what looked meaningful and purposeful to me, but now, um, it's different. And I think I want to underpin one of the key learnings I hear, which is that difference comes from the opportunity to really look at the holistic person and say, actually, this is me. And we've had the unique opportunity to bring our personal and our professional lives together now more than ever in the last two years. And for some, it's really been a reflection point around, oh, that thing, maybe I was just doing that for the business, or maybe I was doing that for me. But now I have the chance to really do something that brings all of my elements together. So just, just to sort of highlight that, I, I believe that purpose evolves, but where I am right now on my purpose journey has been the same for probably the last um, 25 years. Oh. And, and for me, it's, but it's evolved in how I play it out. For me, it's always been around, how can I use my skills, my experience, the platforms that I may find myself in or the companies or the organizations to look at how we address inequality. Mm. And um, I know that I will not have all of the solutions, but I'm very clear that there's resources at hand that we can use to tap into that, right? Um, it's, it's something that, that strikes me and, and comes from, 
from straight at home, where again, I've said I come from Kenya, you know, a country where there's immense wealth, but there's also immense lack of wealth and, and resources and actually lack of choice and, and dignity. And that I think is what, what gets me the most. It's a lack of choice and it's a lack of dignity because you don't always need cash money to have a, a dignified life, you know, choice, the ability to choose what you'd like to do, the ability to do it in a dignified way, I think is very important. And, um, you know, for me, that's been something that I've been constantly uh, um, consumed about. So when I, when I went to school, I, I studied economics because it was important for me to understand this distribution of wealth and, and what that plays out like. I then studied public policy because I thought I wanted to see, you know, what are the frameworks in place that, that allow these systems to, to persist, you know, through health systems, through education systems, through, you know, fiscal systems, et cetera. And, and then when it came to looking for a job, I have to say, I, I, did, I did my graduate school here in the US and my intention was to work in a policy think tank and I couldn't get a job. So I, um, you know, I sort of you know, looked around for eight months and I just couldn't get my foot in the door. Uh, so I went back home and I started working in the field of development, which actually really was a great way to start. And uh, so in playing out that, that purpose and that quest to see how I could contribute to addressing or solving inequality challenges. I actually did about, um, gosh, 10 years or so in the NGO sector, really from grassroots community work to more policy work and then working Pan-African. And then I went into the corporate sector, as you said, which was more about how do companies shift their systems to address inequalities. And now here I am at the UN. So I see it all evolving. I've looked at the inequality challenge from different sectors. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, that's, that's where I am. I want to apply myself, uh, the environments in which I find myself and, and, and the platforms to see how we can create awareness about the fact that immense inequalities exist and see how we can solve those. So then really focusing that on uh, your, your current role, um, what, what, what do you, as there are a lot of people listening in that are in organizations, large and small, mostly large, um, they are organizations, they're, they're leaders who um, typically aren't part of the CSR department, uh, perhaps have not heard about you. Um, I, I find it shocking how many, how few people have actually uh, really understood the SDGs. Let's start there. Um, so as companies start to have this realization or make higher priority of delivering purpose, of delivering regeneration rather than sustainability. Um, what are some of the things that they can look to the United Nations Global Compact to in support? Right. So, so first, and I thank you for bringing that because I think we're acutely aware that, you know, awareness and knowledge of the sustainable development goals is not as widespread as we would like it to be. So first, I think, the Global Compact can help companies understand what the SDGs are and help them translate the opportunities within the SDGs for companies in and of themselves. So, mm -hmm. you know, understanding pieces like climate, which actually is, is talked about quite a lot now, but what does that mean for a company? And what does it mean for a large company? But what does it also mean for a smaller company or a, or a startup? You know, what, what do they need to do around climate action? Um, it will help companies understand gender and the business opportunities within gender, but also what companies can do to have more gender sensitive approaches within the workplace, within the marketplace and within the community. So we can first help companies understand the SDGs and see what the action points are there. I think the second way that we can help companies is then also bring them together. As I said, right now we have a 15,000 membership, you know, companies come in because they want to learn, companies come in because they want to connect, you know, hey, this is what we do here in Mexico, but what do they do in India? What do they do in, in, in Denmark? And, and how can we share and learn from each other and, and listen to, to leadership and take leadership lessons? And then thirdly, there's also companies that wanna lead because they've done a great job and they're ahead of the curve. And we wanna provide them with that opportunity to, to be able to share on that. So for me, it's about learning, connecting and leading, but ultimately actually it's about taking action that will make those shifts uh, in the important areas for business. Um, and as I said, we have toolkits, we have learning resources, we have forums that we've put together. And we also wanna think about what's the next step. So we also have, we call them think labs or innovation pieces. We wanna think about 
what next? Where do companies, where do responsible businesses need to evolve to, to continue on that regenerative path um, as a whole? All right, well, that actually is a great segue into a question that I have in my mind. Uh, we, we have this IRG 100 program, and this week's session was actually about humanized growth at mm -hmm. the organizational level. And uh, I think there are very few organizations that have actually formulated what it is they do for the world in terms of what Paul Pullman calls the blueprint for the world, I believe, or the business plan for the world, the SDGs, mm -hmm. literally aligning their objectives with those SDGs. Um, and just, it's probably very difficult to guess, but if you had to take a guess, how many of the world's companies have actually gone through that exercise? Let's take the top thousand companies. How many of those do you think have actually gone through that exercise? And are there any that you can highlight that you say they've done a really good job in identifying and aligning with SDGs and then developing strategy to pursue the, uh, the goal as defined in the SDG? Yeah. Well, Mark, I, I honestly wouldn't be able to guess because we, we just we just don't keep track of it. But, um, you know, what I do know and I can say with confidence is there's an increasing number of companies that are positioning themselves around the SDGs. Obviously, at the Global Compact, we our membership is based on of companies that sign a letter of commitment from the CEO saying that they're willing to adhere to the 10 principles and contribute to the SDGs. So I would say, you know, I, at least I know of at least 15,000 that are, you know, moving in that trajectory, but certainly there are a lot more than that, but I would hazard to put a guess on it and, and, and put a number. Um, and who's doing a great job? They, gosh, they range from, from so many, you know, you, you talked about uh, Paul and when he was at Unilever, they had the Universal Sustainable Living Plan that really was a blueprint that took all of their products and, and really aligned them to the sustainable development goals. You know, from the UK, Marks and Spencer also did some incredible work um, around that. If I look at Latin America, we have the Natura group of companies ah. that comprises Body Shop, uh, Avon and others that are doing remarkable work around at the core, you know, um, you know some of the work in the Amazon and regeneration work uh, across there. Um, I would be remiss not to mention my former company, Safaricom, where we worked, and I think we were amongst the first companies in Africa at that point in time to define a corporate strategy that was hinged on, you know, nine of, of the SDGs, and, and, and that was really important, you know, um, you know, from the Asian uh, area. I mean, there's lots of companies that are doing some fantastic work around this. I think what's important is not to get overwhelmed by the fact that there's 17 SDGs, but we look at what are the SDGs that are material to your area of business and mm. that you can have influence on and mm. then drive that forward. And I just also wanna say here, you know, the SDGs and the opportunities apply to both large companies and, and smaller companies. And, you know, large companies also need to look out for the fact that they can influence significantly through their supply chains and, and, and their value chains. And it doesn't really just stop at the corporate um, HQ, so to speak. Right. Well, it's it's so funny. I mentioned that this week's session, very serendipitously, was indeed about humanizing growth. And uh, we brought a new partner in. Um, you and most of your viewers will know that the Institute for Real Growth is completely independent. So when I mention a company, I don't have an interest in it. Uh, but they called Innate Motion. And Innate Motion, um, French, Dutch leadership, uh, was the company that I kept hearing about when Unilever went on its journey of uh, crafting uh, Brands for Life and figuring out how a certain brand's focus aligned with the SDGs. And uh, we've been watching them from the sideline for many years now. But today they actually came into the IRG 100 program to talk about the journey and the decision-making flows of aligning your company or your brand with some of the SDGs, because I think that's a that's a gap in uh, in in the toolbox for many of the leaders. Um, are, what what are, you mentioned some of the tools. Uh, what are the tools that you find organizations are using most that you supply? Right. So I mean, first of all, is just the the conceptual framework of the SDGs as a whole. Uh, the way that we've defined our work, really, there's there's multiple programmatic tracks. So, you know, in there, we start with what we call the 10 principles. And those principles for us are 
they are enduring. You know, they they you know they were uh, articulated when we were founded in the year two thousand, and we still adhere to them now. So they've crossed through the period of the Millennium Development Goals into the period of the Sustainable Development Goals. They're kind of like our core DNA, mm-hmm. and uh, it's really understanding principles around human rights. Um, around labor rights, and these map very neatly onto specific sustainable development goals, onto the environment, which is obviously mapping very well to climate, and then onto anti-corruption that looks at some of the goals on justice, peace, um, and strong institutions. So we provide principles, and you see the good thing with this is that, you know, we have these goals, but the principles then allow you to go back to your company, do an analysis and say, okay, so are we doing this? Are we doing that? Sort of a gap analysis, see where the gaps are, and then be able to develop policies and actions that companies need to take. You know, if I look specifically, for example, in the gender area, we have uh, what we use is called a women's empowerment uh, uh, pr- uh, principles, and those principles come to the gap analysis. So you go through the entire company process and look at what are we doing? What are we not doing? Where do we have policies in place? What do we not have in place? And then we hold companies accountable to then develop the policies, set targets, and drive the actions. So, you know, we really do make it practical for companies. What does it mean to look at uh, human rights due diligence within your company and then take action? What are the policies you need to have in place? And what are the practices? So, so we give very practical tools to help you do that. And then we also, as I say, have learning forums where you can, we provide content, but we also have forums where we have speakers come in and talk about key issues and share their company experiences. We have peer learning groups where our local networks and companies at the local and regional levels can share their experiences and exchange um, in in that regard. And as I say, we have the innovation piece, which is let's Mm. look at the next generation thinking, uh, what are the next, the challenges that are coming up for business? And what do some of the leaders in these areas think that we should be moving towards and shaping for businesses coming up? So it's, it's a whole set, you know, as I say, you can lead, you can learn and you can connect, very practical. How do we put it all together? We ask companies to be accountable. So at the end of every year, companies have to uh, submit a report that we call the communication on progress, which you've just digitized and launched um, a refreshed communication progress on a phased approach. We just launched that at the end of the year. Um, And so companies do account for what they've done. And our ideal is that over the years, companies will show progress in, in, in achieving those principles and then contributing towards the SDGs. So this sounds in many ways like a hidden gem for so many business leaders that don't know that this is available. So if I'm sitting here listening to this and thinking I could use quite a few of those resources, how do I go about finding what's available? And how do I even find out if I'm a member? Because I'm not a CEO. Most of the people listening here aren't CEOs, but one level or two levels down. Um, So how does the relationship typically flow? Yeah. So, you know, to join, uh, we ask companies to submit a letter of commitment from their CEO. And for us, that's really important because, you know, you know, sustainable business, regenerative business is is not the work of the head of sustainability or the head of supply chain or whatever position. It's the work of the entire company. Right. So we want to be very clear that we do need that CEO level commitment that they are going to work through these principles and actions through the whole company. So that's where it also starts, let of commitment from the CEO. And from there, we then work at onboarding the company, um, working with the relevant focal people to, to design their pathway through the partnership with the Global Compact. And yeah, some companies want to keep it simple, either because they have resource challenges, people challenges, you know, smaller companies may not engage uh, you know, to a broad extent, but, you know, mid-sized and larger companies have many more uh, engagement opportunities. What we're shifting now is moving a lot more to digital. So there's a lot more access in respect to company size and Mm. look at having content available in appropriate languages and time zones as a whole, but really starts with that, a a commitment letter from the CEO, and that trickles down the next pathway of action. And if you want to know if your company is a member, you can certainly go onto the UN Global Compact website, Ah. um, actually on one of the tabs, there's a portal where you can enter your company name and it'll let you know, obviously, if you find it, great, you're a member. If you don't find it, please join. And so is all your work typically uh, through the CEO or the CSR lead, or do you also interact with other people in organizations? Yeah, Marco, let let me clarify one thing for sure. I mean, the the UN Global Compact is not a CSR organization. I mean, we're not looking, I fully appreciate there's a time and space for 
corporate social responsibility and philanthropy and, and all of that. But what we look at in the Global Compact is how businesses can shift their resources, their financing, their technology, their products and services to deliver better business as well as contribute to societal transformation. So nothing about CSR community or, um, or philanthropy, but we do recognize that community is a key stakeholder in the way that a business first articulates its brand and its purpose and certainly drives forward the stakeholder vision. So just, just, just you know, to park that. But who do we work with? You know, in different companies, we work with a whole range of, of people. Sometimes, yes, it's a sustainability lead. Sometimes it's the CFOs. I know we're working really hard to bring on board more marketing, uh, marketing leads and, and CMOs to, to really embrace this kind of work and see how it helps lend itself to brand purpose. You know, oftentimes we engage HR because we're looking at, you know, internal principles that relate to rights. It's, you know, the work that we do is so cross-cutting across an organization. I think what is really important, though, is to anchor it in the CEO commitment because you're calling for a shift in strategy. You're calling yeah. for a shift in the way Very the clear. company sees itself in the ecosystem. And so that's why that's that's really important. But how we roll it out is really, you know, very dependent on the nature of, of what the business is and the material issues for that business um, and, and how, how it plays out. It's so interesting to hear you say that with the same uh, energy, by the way, as when I was talking to Paul Pullman, who just makes that point over and over again, that this is not an alternative to what we do in business. It's not an add-on to it. It is how we do business. business and so I, when I, I hear that brush, uh, of course, respect for CSR, but the recognition that you need um, the overall company commitment. That said, uh, there's a lot of marketers listening today, watching us. And, uh, and I really want your take. I mean, you were in an organization. Uh, I happen to know the CMO that you were collaborating with, uh, but I've not asked her. I'd love to ask you uh, just, you know, how do you see successful collaboration? What role can the marketer play? Yeah, I, and I think it's such an exciting place at this point in time when there's heightened awareness about purpose in, in brands, there's heightened, you know, consumerism and consumer awareness about what are the brands that we want to buy from and what we want to engage in. You know, we've gone through a period where we've seen such a massive transformation in the pandemic about what businesses can do and how they partner and what businesses have been successful and, and, and those that haven't. So for me, I think the first thing for, for marketers here is that, you know, how a business positions itself from a purpose perspective is truly a brand issue. And I think, you know, brand marketers then play a really key role in this positioning. So, you know, away from even simple product marketing, I think the brand marketing perspective is, is, is really critical. And if that brand marketing can articulate purpose and can articulate principles and can articulate doing business broader than simply profit, but also lending to societal transformation, that I think is a very, very strong uh, role and articulation to play. You know, um, you, we talked about an example on, on, on self-esteem and uh, you know, particular products around that, but think about what that does for women's empowerment, for, for women's confidence around issues such as gender-based violence, women's capacity to, to be able to feel that they feel empowered to speak out with inequalities. And it's really, you know, it's really, I think, you know, edifying to see that brands are willing to take on those challenges and challenge stereotypes. And, and challenge what businesses should be doing. So for me, the brand marketing pitch, I think is, is really, really important from a, from a marketing perspective. And then secondly, just how you then speak to customers or consumers on a day-to-day -day basis through your products. So, mm. you know, here I could go very, you know, um, sort of zero in on things such as, you know, how sustainable, how regenerative are some of the products that we place on our shelves and, and what do you do around that? What do you do around packaging? What do you do around life cycles of, of products, you know, as you market, what are the materials that you're using? And as you take things out, out, out to market and beyond, I think there's a great, you know, thinking piece that goes around that as a whole, you know, and then finally, because I, I just, I know that there's a lot of um, interplay between actual communications and, and marketing, and I'm not a specialist in this, so I don't want to sort of, you know, go off track to, but I do think, as I said, in the areas of heightened consumer awareness, 
the communication that comes out of a company. And I think driven by marketing and, and well-grounded purpose and principles is, is really important. So I see it play at the brand level. I see it play at the product level. Then I see it play out in the day-to-day -day marketing and communications piece. And I think companies that have been successful uh, in, in demonstrating their positioning around sustainable and responsible business have been able to tick a big win against all three of those areas. You know, it's so interesting. We're, we're, um, we're actually organizing for the first time as IRG, we're, we're organization, uh, organizing a re regeneration retreat. And it's um, about um, regenerative marketing as well as regenerating at the personal leadership level because the, you can either resign or you can regenerate. And um, at the regenerative marketing level, we're really bringing together a, um, a body of work where brands uh, go beyond what they do to the what their communication and products inspire the rest of the world, the billions of people they talk to do. And you mentioned the self-esteem work just now. Um, there's uh, work around um, women's uh, health uh, in India, around making taboos, um, you know, topics that can be addressed. And... Um, and, and, and I see a huge opportunity for bringing that together and really lifting the purpose work to a, a, a higher plateau that is around regeneration against and around the, uh, the SDGs. Um, work in progress, uh, but so much to learn from and be inspired by. Um, I want to ask you, if we may, a, a last topic, which is uh, peripheral, but very relevant, which is this overall movement by companies uh, from what we call shareholder primacy to multi-stakeholder value creation. A lot of organizations were already beginning to tinker with that, uh, looking at it. COVID gave it a huge push in the back uh, in terms of priority. And now there's a lot of companies making that move, uh, but stumbling on the way and figuring it out. As you see your members do that, uh, as you see other organizations, perhaps your experience at Safaricom, any lessons learned on do's and don'ts in that shift? Yeah, and, and I, I like that you said it's, you know, companies will pick up and they will stumble on the way because it's not that simple. It's, 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 there's a lot of, I think, uh, deep reflection that needs to happen around um, some of those shifts. And I can just, you know, share a few. Um, and, it, you know, some, some, are, some require, you know, massive shifts in the way that you think about business. But you first got to understand the why. You know, you can't simply be doing this because it looks like capital flows to companies that are purpose-led. Because what we're really asking for is an entire shift in the way that you do business for the long term, not just for the short term. So I think understanding the why is critical. Why is it important to take a multi-stakeholder approach to the work that you do? Yeah, um, because that will require you to change your strategy, to change your systems, to change the way that you even communicate as a company, because it's a shift away from, for example, quarterly reporting and quarterly numbers, which will still remain important, but also having the long term trajectory and view in place, so understanding the why. Um, I think second, really important to be able to cascade that why or that vision, uh, you know, board, you need definitely need board support and then you need business support, you know. Um, as well as to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, as I talked about the shift from the short term to the long term, sometimes you even have to shift what success looks like. We talked about a few companies, uh, you know, the Universal uh, Sustainable Living Plan. I can talk about the work that we did in Safaricom where our entire brand communication was about transforming lives. It had nothing to do with telco. Yeah. What does success look like for the company then? It, it wasn't only about data and, and megabytes and, and you know, minutes of consumption. It was about the, the carbon footprint. It was about our gender equality. It was about STEM, women and women in technology. You know, it was about a sustainable and inclusive supply chain. All of those elements made up a successful company. And, and I remember and how it played out actually in a very practical way was that after a couple of years of successive investor roadshows, yeah, what the conversation then became about is tell us about these 
sustainability fundamentals of the company. Mm -hmm. People were looking at beyond the numbers. The conversation was no mm -hmm. longer about your financials because, you know, thankfully they were great. Now it was more about what's your future trajectory? How are you going to make more people financially included in Kenya? What value does growing a network lend to the Kenyan economy in terms of education, agriculture, uh, financial inclusion? So it broadens up a whole wide range of, of opportunities, but it definitely shifted what success meant for the company. Um, but then, of course, you've got to be able to chart out what your ecosystem is, what your multi-stakeholder ecosystem is. Yeah. And that may take many different shapes and forms. Yes, the customer is definitely at the center, but you may have regulators, you may have government, you certainly will have investors, um, you could have media. You know, it really depends on what industry you're in and, and, and what that looks like. Um, and I think, you know, finally, it's just then really making the commitment for the concrete action. Because um, definitely, I believe the, the ROI um, or the numbers will play out over time. I always believe do the right thing and the numbers will come. But you've got to be able to be very sure that you're able to take the concrete actions to move you forward. Um, mm -hmm. It's definitely a journey. It's definitely a journey. It's a reorientation for, for many organizations um, as, they, as they take it on. Now, just to pick on that last thing you said, the uh, measure the progress, show the results. Um, I, it's my understanding, and I know too little about this, that the big accountancy firms, I think even collectively, are working on a set of metrics so that people can prove what they've done. Um, do, do you know anything about that? Is it getting closer? Because I'm so worried that when companies are investing significant resources and time of their leaders in these initiatives, and they're not being recognized because it's not being measured in a consistent manner, that things will fall flat. How is that? How is that progressing? What is your perspective on that? Yeah. Oh, there's lots going on in this field, Mark. Like lots, you know. Um, but really, underpinning it all is the theory that you know success for a company is above and beyond its its financials, right? Yeah. So people are looking at how do you account for issues such as environmental footprint, you know, how do you account for issues such as longer term sustainability frameworks? There yeah. are lots of frameworks. There's a lot going on. You know, some of it is is grounded in regulation. As it off, you know, as it is primarily from the, those uh, movements and, and alliances that are building and frameworks that are driven, driven through the EU. Others are more around focused on what is a material issue at the moment, which is climate and the environment. Um, ours, as I say in the communication on progress, I mean, not a reporting standard per se, but ours is really about a more holistic approach and probably one of the most broadest approaches. Um, around sustainability reporting. So there's many issues. Um, you know, I don't know that we're ever going to land on one reporting framework for the world that will demonstrate where we want to go on purpose, principles, and profit. But I am grateful that the space has, has opened up to understand that company success and the company narrative doesn't solely rest on its financials. Yeah, yeah, a lot of work happening indeed. Um, Sandra, I, I, I want to thank you. And, and before we close, um, I, I, we started this conversation about you as a person, then as a leader, and, I, and I, I'd like to end there too. Um, I have to say it's inspiring, truly inspiring and counterintuitive to hear such business focus, holistic performance focus from a leader of uh, an agency, which perhaps many people listening to this would have a prejudice around bureaucracy and uh, living in the US, the UN is often uh, also becoming a victim in the politics. Um, but nevertheless, to hear that strength, that conviction and that very practical orientation to well, towards helping the people in this podcast, listening and watching this webinar uh, is tremendously inspiring. Um, perhaps I can indeed end with a personal question, which is, as you look at these leaders and you think about your own journey, uh, what along the way do you wish you'd known earlier? That you, <laughs> what is it that people can learn? Uh, we all have lessons that we've learned. What, what is yours? Wow. Well, um, you know, so, so let, me, let me tie it back in. But I don't know if I, if I would say I need to have known it earlier, but perhaps that I wish I had integrated in everything that I'd done uh, earlier, per se, which is, this, this piece around where we are right now, which is the important role that business can and should play in societal transformation, because it's, it's evolved. So I don't know that I could have known it earlier because you know, the eighties, we were really in, in the CSR space. You know, that's sort of when mm. the CSR piece really took root. But I often wonder what if 
we had put a lot more emphasis in actually asking businesses not to respond only in that way, but to really look at business purpose and, and what those shifts could have been. Holistically. Where would we be now? Yeah. And so that, that would be my thing. You know, what if we had engaged businesses earlier in a different way? And, you know, what would then this multi-stakeholder world look like, the stakeholder ecosystem look like in, in that regard? Because, you know, some of the shifts that we seek to make in business right now are so critical and they're so monumental. You know, look at the climate piece and what we're asking companies to do to decarbonize by a 2030 or a 2050 piece. What if we had that clarity and sense of urgency 20 years ago? Would we be in the climate crisis that we are right now? You know, mm. what if companies had paid a lot more attention to issues such as gender equity and gender pay parity? What would the positioning of women be? You know, I read this stat that is totally mind boggling that, you know, it'll take 275 years to achieve, you know, economic or gender pay parity amongst women. I mean, what does that mean, Mark? Mm. 275 mm. years, you know. Mm. What if we were very clear that child labor just isn't, it really shouldn't exist? What would that mean for the millions of, of kids who have had to forego education, uh, empowerment, you know, early marriage, early childbirth, you know, that kind of stuff. So yeah. for me, it's more a what if we knew this earlier and what would it look like? Yeah, yeah. And, and then my mind immediately goes to and then if we now pretend we're 20 years later from now, what do I wish I'd done now? And there's yes. my action plan. <laughs> and I think that's, why, that's why we've just got to be ambitious. I think we've really got to stretch within the opportunities that we have right now. Yes. Well, again, it's inspiring to know that there is a UN organization so practical and so almost service oriented to its members to make something that we all agree needs to happen anyway, happen faster and, um, and, and probably better because we're learning from each other's mistakes and successes. Sanda Audiambo, I really want to thank you. I also want to thank all the listeners and all the viewers. And I want to tell you that we have very exciting future Humanizing Growth Series uh, episodes coming up. Two weeks from now, we're talking, uh, Frank will be talking to uh, Daniel Hume, who's the CEO of an organization called Satali. And they are probably the number one or very close to it, implementers of applying AI to very important uh, business tasks, like for example, recruitment. Uh, incredibly interesting. Uh, also some big warnings there about what can happen when we don't really know what we're doing and we don't have the controls in place. Uh, join us for that. Two weeks later, we have Hala Tomas Dottir. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but I'm sure you know her, the CEO of the B team, uh, coming to talk to us about many of the things we talked about today and, and even more on the personal leadership front there, really appealing to leaders, you and your journey, your purpose and the difference you can make with your organization in achieving that. And then two weeks after that, we have the uh, global CEO of Heineken, Dolf van den Brink, uh, talking about that company's uh, developments. And of course, they made a huge purchase in the south of Africa just uh, last month with uh, Distel becoming part of the Heineken group. We've had three people in our program. Uh, very exciting. But um, for now, I want to thank you all for viewing. And I want to close with a last thank you to you, Sanja Odiambo. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me.